Stefan in Australia writes, Greetings, Paul. Greetings, Stephen. I really appreciate your videos. I appreciate you watching them. Thank you. Uh, I ensure that when listening to my system that my chair has a low below the head back, good, good work, so that the ambient sounds are not absorbed. But I also have been aware that wearing or not wearing spectacles make a considerable difference to the quality of sound that I hear. Is this a thing or is it just me? No, it's a thing. <laughs> Absolutely a thing. So I remember 50 years ago when Stan Warren and I started PS Audio. It's Paul and Stan Audio. And Stan, from the day I knew him, was a spectacle wearer, eyeglasses. And he would always pull his glasses off when he was listening critically to music, especially when we were <clears throat> working hard to um, design products. I mean, because a lot of our design process is in the listening. You have this great idea for a circuit, you build the circuit, you measure it, everything looks good, but how does it sound? You have to go ahead and listen. That's the only way to do it. You know, it's like, I, it just cracks me up how people go, wow, well, I mean, you know, if it measures well, it's going to sound well. No, sorry, that's not true. It's just simply not true. That's like saying if you get all the ingredients in a recipe just right, it's going to taste great. And that's simply not true. So I can tell you a number of times that I have gotten every ingredient right in the exact proportions and it didn't taste good. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that, right? I didn't do this right, I didn't do that right, or it was a bad recipe, okay? So there's really no difference. You can The only way you can do this is by listening. So Stanley would always take his glasses off. And the reason this is, is when we have stereo sound coming from the left and the right speaker, that sound comes over here, hits your ear, bounces off your face, there's a time period, and comes over to this ear. And then the same over here. If the sound is reflecting off of your glass, especially if you have big ones, it will distort the way it sounds by the time it hits over here. And it absolutely changes the imaging. I, I've done the experiment. I mean, you can sit and listen like that, close your eyes, and take them off. It sounds a little bit different. Now, is it a huge change? Oh gosh, no. It's very tiny and you have to be listening for it. One of the, th as I'm, I'm, I'm writing, I think I've mentioned this before, an all new audio files guide. It's going to be a series of at least 10 books and just in writing the, one of the first books, which is Unlocking the Secrets of Analog Audio, I wrote a whole passage on training ourselves how to listen. And I had to go through that. When I first started in this, Stan was already an audiophile. He already had this down, been doing it for years. I was just the engineering nerd, right? I had designed the first circuit. He loved the way it sounded. I listened to it at his place. I thought, yeah, that sounds really good. But then he started playing with this and playing with that. And he goes, you hear that? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> I had to teach myself how to listen. How to, well, first, what to listen for, how to listen. I had to train myself to become a listener. And then, here's the part that you don't need to worry about. But once you get trained up as a listener, if you're going to further your career as an engineering person, and building products, you then have to figure out what differences you hear, how does that affect the circuit or the driver if you're making speakers or the crossover, right? So if you hear something is too far forward or everything is scrunched together, what do you do about it? As an engineer, I, you know, it's measuring good. What do you do about it? 
Well, in, in a lot of cases, you have to completely change the circuit. In some cases, you have to make a little tweak. I'll, I'll give you an example. I've been working on a new product, of which I'm not going to tell you what it is. And we, I mean, we spent a good year getting this thing to measure like stupidly nice. And it really measures great. Put it upstairs and listened to it, compared it to our existing product, and I'm thinking, everything is so much better about this, except the older product had a little bit more romance to it. Just, I don't know how else to describe it, a sweetness, a honeyness, a, a roundness to the sound. Went back to this new product, listened, oh man, the depth, the clarity, the imaging, the tonal balance, perfection. But it was a little colder and a little less rounded, a little bit more etched. So, now, what do you do about it? If you're just starting out in this, I don't know that most people would have a clue what to do about it. I knew what to do about it because, well, I've done this for, I guess, uh, longer than, uh, let's see, 50 years. I'm 76. Yeah, longer than I've been alive as, as, a, as a percentage. So, yeah, it takes a lot of time to do it. And many of you might be asking, well, what did you do about it? Well, one of the things you can do, and, and, and by the way, this is some of the stuff that I would like to eventually memorialize in part of the Audiophiles Guide series of books. I want to put all this stuff that I've learned over the years so it doesn't have to be reinvented again because how many of us are out there now that know what to do? And there's lots of stuff you could do, but in this particular one, I took an easy shot and it worked beautifully. And what was that? Well, in the middle of this circuit, there's a buffer. And a buffer is just a way of helping impedances play nice together. Okay, so you know you want to have a low impedance going into a high impedance. Maybe you need more current. Any number of reasons why you would use an audio buffer. And in that buffer, I had had a really cool BJT. Okay, BJT, a, a, a bipolar junction transistor, a regular transistor. I changed that out to a FET a field effect transistor buffer. Now, FETs are more like vacuum tubes. They're voltage devices where a BJT is a current device. And sometimes you want to use a BJT because it draws every ounce of whatever is there. The detail is extraordinary on it. JFETs, like vacuum tubes, keep that detail intact but don't emphasize it. It doesn't come out with this etched quality. It comes out with this kind of golden glow. Now, sometimes that can be bad. You don't always use that because it gets syrupy and doesn't sound like music. In this case, it just balanced it out. Like adding a pinch of this and a pinch of that. Boom! Sounds amazing. Tastes amazing. So, if you're a foodie like me, you'll get it. Just little tiny bits. Here I am rambling. Once again, there is this restaurant we went to in the middle of nowhere, Lions, Colorado. It's called Marigold. This guy is a James Beard awarded chef. Who knew? In the middle of this little Bullfart Acre town, right? And he's got this high-end restaurant sitting on the street. And Terry and I, being vegetarians, it got a lot of meat stuff on it, but there was this one dish called a celery yak. And if you don't know what that is, I didn't at the time, it's a celery root. And what he does is he takes one of these apple, you know, the spiral apple peelers, and he turns it like that, and he winds out this razor thin pasta made out of celery root. And he whips it up in this pistachio miso uh, sauce and then it's it's like a pasta dip. It's hard to describe with a couple of pistachios and this sauce and then at the end he takes a blowtorch and he crisps up some of the end. 
oh my dear God, Parmesan over the whole thing. It was just exquisite. But it used celery root, for God's sakes. So anyway, why am I going off about that? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> All right. I hope that's not too much rambling for you. All right. Take it easy. <laughs> Bye.